we are live. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the BKB24 post-fight reflections with me, George Glinski, joined as always by my favourite Italian, Paolo Lee. How are we doing? Good mate, I think I'm the only Italian you know though, and I'm not really Italian, so... Yeah, that's true actually. I mean, <laughs> also favourite Mancunian, I know a few of them. Thank you, that'll do. I'll do that. <laughs> Thank you mate, yeah I'm good, how are you? Yeah, really good mate, really good. I think we spoke just off camera then about how excited we are for this post-fight reflections. I mean, it's been a long time since I've got that buzz, and I think BKB24 for me, one of the greatest cards we've ever seen, and... Yeah, it, it felt like I felt right at the start when I started covering the sport. It was just an incredible card. So many great performances, so many great fights. And yeah, just really excited to break this one down, aren't we? Absolutely. Hats off to Jim and Joe. This was probably the best, if not one of the best shows that they've had. Just everything came together lovely. A few upsets, a few beatdowns, a few very 50-50 razor fin competitions. It had it all. And the... The flow through the night, the atmosphere, yeah, you can't fault it, mate. It's great, wasn't it? Definitely, definitely. So let's get into it. The first fight of the night between Aaron McCallum and Johnny Lawson turned out to be, well, a shock in the sense that it was the first person to finish Johnny Lawson with strikes. Of course, he's been finished with cuts in the past. He's been knocked down before, but never finished. And Aaron McCallum was the first man to do that with a beautiful looping overhand right. Legs buckled, never really recovered from that shot and ultimately the right decision with the stoppage, Paolo. Yeah, definitely. I think the decision was right. You could argue Johnny wasn't looking that bad, but he was clearly mm. unsteady on his feet. And when you start getting hit and start turning with the shots, to start turning away, then, yeah, it's, it's time to call it in. I'm not saying that Johnny was turning away intentionally, but I mean the momentum of the shots was sort of putting him very off balance because his legs weren't quite there. So I think a great decision from Clive. Just um, just unlucky with Johnny because he, it came from him getting a good flurry in and then just McCallum winging one over the top, which landed. So this is bare knuckle, isn't it? That's why we love the the unpredictability of it. We just, you know, gutted for Johnny, obviously. Um, but anything can happen, can't you? And you can't take away from McCallum because you threw the shot with the intention of it landing and that's what it did. Mm. Yeah, it was it was a shame because, you know, Lawson was coming out to box. He he looked really good in the early stages. I think it was a, a little flurry um, against the the shelled up Aaron McCallum, and then just an exploding overhand right at the point of pause. Just just one of those a a, a really well timed and well placed shot. You can't really recover from those. There's there's that concern, isn't there? Like every single time that you get finished for the first time, has Johnny Lawson's durability gone down? I don't know. It's hard to say, but you know the guy has had so many wars in BKB. His his chin has held up so many times. It was going to happen eventually. It's it is gutting. It really is. Obviously, I I shared the hotel room with Johnny. I spoke to him afterwards. He he was disheartened, but I think took it really well. That's the first time he's ever been finished as I say, in, in any combat sport, not just bare knuckle boxing. So more upbeat than I expected, but ultimately disheartened. Next up, it was a third round TKO victory for Mark Tiffin on his debut against Bo Besley, who, of course, we remember beating Will Cairns on the last card. Another lad from Leeds, another lad with serious power in his hands. Mark Tiffin, an ugly fight. I'd say an ugly fight. I think when you have someone as long and rangy, as bestly and as awkward as he is, I think he's always going to be an ugly fight. And Tiffin is a brawler. He really is. I think he's he's very hard and straight down the middle. Um, beautiful overhand right. Nice short overhand right in the third round at the start of the round to, to finish Bestley, showing that he doesn't need much space to work with. Is there more to come from Mark Tiffin? I think so. He trains down in Leeds. You know, he's around the right people to improve his bare boxing. I thought it was... Uh, an ugly fight, I'll, I'll say it again, a bit of an ugly fight, but I think we saw little glimmers of a potential very solid fighter in Mark Tiffin. Yeah, agreed, mate. It's difficult. You just fight whoever's put in front of you. And if you're put against someone very awkward, a southpaw as well, quite long and reachy, and who's got quite a start-stop style of fighting, it's difficult yeah. to show your skill because that style of fight sort of chokes the action really so 
Definitely, there's more from Tiff here. Like, if we just see him against someone a bit more orthodox, someone at, where the action flows a bit more. Mm. I do agree with you in that it was a bit of an ugly fight. Yeah. What I, th- I think they were <laughs> overcommitting in their attacks, and that led to stalemate, 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 commit and get tied up. So there wasn't that free-flowing style. Uh, it, it wasn't as bad as, but it did remind me a little bit of um, Barbaru Dudi from BKB22. Yeah. Where they just stood away from each other for ages, nothing, 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 then commit, tangle up and get separated. It wasn't on that level, but a bit of a scrappy fight. But look, these happen, especially with Southport Orthodox mixes. So... Hopefully, next one's a bit more free flowing. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was, I'll be honest, I, I have to be honest on these things. It's probably the only fight on the night I didn't really enjoy. It was a card of such quality that this fight did kind of stand out. And, and that's obviously no disrespect to either man. It was just the fact that the two styles didn't mix particularly well. Uh, Besley coming forward, you know, falling short regularly with his chin up in the air. And Tiffin just having a few opportunities where he could have capitalised. But it being his BKB debut, of course, he's fought on the regional circuit. You, you can you can give him the exception on that. But he made the adjustments in the later rounds. He Rather than coming forward and, and falling into Besley, he, he allowed him to come onto him. He yeah. lured him onto that overhand right. And that really paid dividends in that fight. So I think there was a nice little technical adjustment. A lot more to come from Tiffin and, of course, Besley as well. I'm just interested to see where the two of them go. And, and hopefully they just get, you know... A bit of a bit of matchmaking that will that will favour their styles. Next up was Martin Rafael versus Johnny Jones. Two lads coming in on their debut. You never know what to expect when you have two de- debutants who have boxed extensively. Both men, you know, credentialed boxers, but haven't fought bare knuckle. It's a very different sport. And this one, just a little bit of a shame. I would have liked it to go on a bit longer. It yeah. was it was shaping up to be a great fight. Johnny Jones coming forwards, gets caught with a straight right from Martin Rafael, dropped early in that first round. And then it was a, a nasty, nasty cut um, above the lip, similar to the Jimmy Sweeney versus Ricardo Franco fight. That's what stopped the fight ultimately. But the two men were just going at it and they showed a really nice technical display and at a very high pace. It was, it was a real shame because a fight like that, if that goes three rounds, that's a potential yeah. fight the night candidate. So... I was gutted. I was gutted, to be honest, that it was stopped so early. But, you know, massive respect to Martin Rafael. Caught him with a corker of a shot and, and deservedly won that round. And, and you know, with him winning that round with, with the cut, you, you can't take it away from Rafael at all. But super impressive in the fact, you know, Martin Rafael, 10-5 and five as an unlicensed boxer, 1-0 and 0 as a professional boxer. And Johnny Jones, 43-6 and six amateur boxing, five, four-time, sorry, four-time Welsh national amateur champion which oh. is mental great credentials so for Rafael who's come from that unlicensed bu- boxing background come into the sport late to drop Johnny Jones and, and show his class over two minutes of action with a guy with such incredible credentials I think we're looking potentially uh, at a future contender in Martin Rafael and and Johnny Jones I do agree I'd love to see Jones again I'd love to see both of them again and you're right, it's so frustrating because that would have been an absolute corker of a fight, really well matched. From the start, Jones came out beautiful, very fast, crisp, sharp, straight shots. His pedigree showed in, in a few moments there, his control, everything. It's just that thunderbolt right hand from Rafael came from nowhere. And it was, again, there's no point saying it's a lucky shot. He threw it with the intent of it landing and it landed. You know, he weathered a bit, Rafael weathered a bit of a storm. And then when there's a little break, bang, pops that right hand. Mm. Just made um, Jones touch down, but the, the cut was awful, instant. It was, um, mm. Medic next to me said, uh, I, I'm not letting him fight with that. That's because that's going to tear all the way. Mm. That's got to be finished there. Cracking, fa- well, in the short amount of time it was. It was. Great, right? No, it was. And I, I think people will probably agree that you know that that it was it sounds a bit weird to say this after one round but it was shaping up to be a legendary fight it was shaping up I remember just that round coming to the end of that round turning to Jim and going wow what a great fight and then ah and then it stops it was gutting I'd like to say that I want to see a rematch I kind of do but obviously with a fight like that that didn't have much significance it was a debutant fight I think the two of them will likely fight 
different opponents and, and hopefully come together down the line. But yeah, a, a really, really good round of action and just a little bit disappointing it didn't go the three. And the new British middleweight champion, Matthew Hodgson, super impressive performance. Both of us gave him performance of the night in his demolition job of Lawrence Tracy, a fourth round TKO. I think five knockdowns in the process, won every single round, won every single minute of every single round and just impressed us massively, didn't he, Paolo? Yeah, the hammer absolutely blew us away. It, the, the perfectly designed and executed game plan, taking into account the strengths and weaknesses of both fighters. Mm. You can tell they've done their homework at Golden Team Gym. And a quick shout out to the architects behind the demolition job, Patrick McDonough at the um, Golden Team Gym. That plan was ex designed great by Patrick and executed perfectly by Matty. The way that Matty kept range, long straight shots to head and body, when you're fighting a small person, a lot of people neglect the body. But Matty remembered to switch it up and downstairs. And in fact, he got quite a few knockdowns from switching head to body, body to head. Yeah. He didn't get backed up on the ropes in a straight line, which is what small fighters love to do against taller guys. Back them up in a straight line against the ropes, get the work off. Instead, Matty either held and got the referee involved or circled off and got back to the centre again. So another good nice thing I noticed as well was walking on uh, Lawrence Tracy onto uppercuts against a short fight that especially good. I mean Tracy wasn't he did land a few shots himself. You know, notably yeah. I think you said when we were talking off camera, one in the third that snapped Matty's head back, and he did get a good rib shot in in the first round as well. So it he wasn't he was he he was there, but it was. Go as far to say a landslide. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, it wasn't as competitive as I think we thought it would be coming in. Yeah. Tracy moving in straight lines and and Hodgson angling out with the high guard. I don't know where the guard is placed, but it seemed like it was covering his eyes. He he would often come forwards and Hodgson would be to the side of him and strike him, and he'd he'd, he'd almost be coming forwards to the invisible man. It was it was it. It was a strange fight, a strange gelling of styles. Obviously, the longer man, Hodgson, he needed to be on his bike. He did exactly that. But Tracy just didn't have that explosivity that I would have liked to have seen from him, that we've seen from him in previous fights. We did see a recent Facebook post from Tracy saying that he'd yeah. been in hospital after the fight with food poisoning. Of course, I'm not taking anything away from Hodgson at all, but it must be mentioned as it, <clears throat> as it was on social media. Whether or not that's true, we don't know. We don't know that, of course. It's, you know, this is fighters are known for coming up excuses. I'm not saying that he is or he isn't, but it's something that needs to be noted. He just didn't have that spring in his step. And as the smaller man, he needed to do more defensively. He needed to dip. He needed to slip and roll into range. And he was just coming forwards with his hands up. Just a lack of variance, I think. But no reason why he can't go back to the drawing board and, and massively improve in those areas, I think we've seen a lot of potential from Tracy. He's a very exciting come forward fighter, but I think it was a gelling of a, an off night for Tracy and, and a very on night for Hodgson. It's a good point that you sort of hinted at there is that Tracy seemed to fail to adapt. Mm. He didn't seem to have a game plan coming back at the end of the first, at the end of the second, realising I'm not getting inside uh, Hodgson's range here. And saying to his corner, let's try something else. Or mm. it just seemed to be the same again and again, coming forward in a straight line, yeah. Matty would angle off. And Matt seemed to have an answer for everything that that Tracy threw at him. Um so I'm I'm struggling to decide whether did Tracy have an off night, or was when we last saw him out, he was facing an, an opponent who stood toe to toe with him in the pocket. Yeah. which is the exact wrong strategy. So I don't know if it's Tracy not having a good night or if it's more that Hodgson's tactics were just good. It's, obviously, there's no real answer. It's all opinion, isn't it? Um, I reckon to help us decide, we need to see Tracy out again. I think so. And I, and I think there'll be a mix of both. I think I yeah. think that's fair to say. But ultimately, the, the long, rangy Hodgson played to his strengths. And, you know, the compact, shorter 
Lawrence Trace. He didn't. And that was the real key decider. He didn't make himself a small target. He didn't dip low. He didn't cover his body with his own guard. It was He was upright. He was covering to the head, leaving the body exposed, which allowed Hodgson to go head and body, head and body. Yeah. There was just a few little things. And I think what's nice about a performance like that is you see it so often when a fighter is beaten handedly, they can go back to the drawing board, they can see exactly what they do, did wrong, and they can come back stronger than ever. So expect that from Lawrence Tracy. He's extremely motivated. You know, he's a great character in the sport. And yeah, just a massive well done to Matthew Hodgson. I've, I've not seen him box like that before. Amazing. I think, as you say, a brilliant game plan. I think Porrick did an awesome job of putting that game plan together. And Matthew Hodgson listening to his coach, which is the key when you are a boxer, to listen to your coach. So few fighters actually do it. And he he stuck to the game plan beautifully, showed massive variance, tucked up, tucked that chin, which we saw was a little bit of a problem in the last fight against Ashley Gibson, made the adjustments, went back to the drawing board from that fight and came in the perfect version of himself. Before we end on that, I've just got a little uh, little pearl, a little Easter egg, if you can uh, manage to find it. At the very, the very, very start of the fight, just as the bell, the first bell rings, um, commentary team Tom Ross is is telling two stories at once, and he accidentally said, um, gave us a special message from the Philippines from eight weight world champion. He said, um, "What did he say now?" <laughs> Manny Pacquiao said, "Both of these men are in great shape." So if you listen, <laughs> listen out for that. Is a uh, Mixed up his words there. So uh, well done, Matty and um, Lawrence, because uh, Manny Pacquiao said you're both in great shape, apparently. <laughs> message from the Philippines. Jake Kerr versus Stephen Evans next. An interesting story coming into the fight. Jake Kerr obviously coming in on late notice. Didn't turn up to the weigh-in until it had finished, which is always worrying for a new fighter. Did turn up, came in, got, on to, got in and, and weighed in at the correct weight. And then went missing on the night, which was bizarre. I, I genuinely thought he'd done a runner. I, I'll be honest with you. I genuinely, I saw him in the, in the tent just beforehand. He was in the corner. And then the next thing you know, we hear the, we, well, it was, I think it was Sammy on the mic saying, can Jay Kerr come and get his hands wrapped? And that was, I think, 20 minutes, 30 minutes before the fight, which was very Jeff Chiffins-esque. I'm not sure he was asleep <laughs> like Jeff Chiffins was that time, but he turned up and... Really impressed me, if I'm honest. I, I, I'm going to say this on camera. I actually didn't think that Jake uh, was going to compete with Stephen Evans. I thought, you know, that Stephen Evans w- had his number. He was, a, he was a much better boxer. Uh, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say that at all. But Jake Kerr, uh, showing his athleticism, came in and, and nicked a draw. Just very impressed. Obviously, he came in on short notice. He didn't have the legs in him to go the three rounds, but managed to drop Stephen Evans in that first round and caused him some real problems. It just took a long time for Stephen Evans to get going. He's a credentialed amateur boxer. Jay Kerr coming from an unlicensed uh, boxing background, a mixed martial arts background, doesn't have the same boxing credentials, hasn't boxed as many times as Stephen Evans, but competed admirably. And a lot of that had to do with not allowing the technical boxer of Stephen Evans to get that jab going, you know, pouring out that lead hand, taking away the jab with the parries. It just really was a difficult lead hand fighting fight for the Southpaw against the Orthodox. Obviously, Jake Kerr, he switched, but mostly for in Orthodox. And for Stephen Evans, in the second and third round, when he realised that he could push through that lead hand and land his straight left, that's when he really found his success in those later rounds. But I'm starting to think if Jay Kerr hadn't have faded, his gas tank hadn't have faded in round two and three, he might have had enough there to beat Stephen Evans, which was a real shock for me coming in. I think Stephen obviously had an off night. I mean, it goes without saying he wasn't at his best, but Jay Kerr causing all sorts of problems, very, very fast, very powerful, strong, uh, long, and just everything you look at, for an athletic boxer, just has every single every single attribute that you need to be a bare knuckle boxer. So, you know, bit of a gas tank, and that guy could be a massive problem for lads at the higher weights. Yeah, agreed. It'd be good to see him back, and uh, potentially a bit more, bit more notice, a bit more prep. Mm-hmm. He seemed really comfortable in there. I thought you could tell he, he's having to mess about, relax. He was smiling a lot. Tell he was thinking. Not in a panic sort of way, but I could tell he's just looking at his opponent, thinking sometimes, mm. having a little laugh. He, he seemed really comfortable in there. And I, I, did, I did quite enjoy the way he had 
two years, let's say. I'm not mm-hmm. saying uh, going forward and tired, but I mean, he'd push the fight sometimes, mm-hmm. but then he'd step off the gas and you'd see him wanting to walk on, walk Evans, the southpaw, onto his left hook. Mm-hmm. So you could see him waiting, waiting for Evans to come forward, not trying to walk on, mm-hmm. walk on Evans, walk Evans onto his left hook. Yeah. Um, Oh, Scrappy, I do agree with you that Evans don't, don't think seem to be sharp as he usually is. Yeah. But um, I'd like to see him both back soon. Yeah, and I think when you come from that amateur boxing background, you know, the amateur style is very similar. We In the amateurs, we all do box fairly similarly. Um, but JK comes in with a, a wild, brawling style, long, rangy, athletic, as I say, just the perfect storm to really throw you off your momentum. And I think it was less, well, obviously Stephen Evans, I believe he said he didn't have a great camp and so on and so forth. But I really do believe that just the awkwardness and and the speed of Jay Kerr was enough to really highlight the fact that Stephen Evans wasn't on his game, if that makes sense. But yeah, Jay Kerr, impressed. Look forward to seeing him again. Stephen Evans, he'll come back. There might be a rematch in this one. I don't know. When I spoke to them in the post-fight, I think Stephen was was keen for the rematch. I think Jake uh, made a joke about it, have, calling him out when he was the champion or something. I, he was buzzing. He was happy with the draw. <laughs> I think I think when you come in on that short notice, he had his tooth hanging out. It was Oh, I um, didn't like that at all. No, that was that was bad. But yeah, Jake uh, was a really entertaining character and I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing him back and, and hoping that Stephen Evans will come back stronger as well. Next up, the rematch. Mark Handley versus Callan Harley. The first fight was absolutely incredible. It was one of those fights that really surprised us. I think we knew that both lads could have a scrap, but to that level, it was it was unbelievable. But this fight, again, an entertaining fight. It did finish in the second round with a TKO victory. Well, I'd say a KO victory in the end um, from Callan Harley. But this time, there was a difference. There was a real difference in the style and in the approach from Callan Harley. Looking into his eyes as he walked into that ring, he's such a nice guy and he's always smiling and happy. But I always wondered whether or not he was taking it as seriously as I would like to think. And on that fight night, there was this real something different behind his eyes. He he looked hungry. He looked angry almost. I think he was really disappointed with the draw in the last fight. He was disappointed in his performance. He knew he could do better. And he came out with a point to prove. And boy, did he prove a point. Super impressed by Callan Harley, his best performance to date. I think the difference here was just that little half step back where he would stay in range and get caught with Mark Handley reacting to him coming forwards. He just took that little step back, angled out, reset, took his time, composed, and used his range, which he should have done in the first fight. And it was a horrible, horrible shot, wasn't it? Straight right, the knuckle in the eye. And I feel really sorry for Mark Handley because obviously you would have seen at BKB 16 the, the horrific injury that he received against Brad Pickett. This one was even worse. And a point to to note, it was Mark Handley's last fight. So not the way you want to go out, but a guy who's been a massive servant to the company and, and to the sport of mixed martial arts as well as bare knuckle boxing. But yeah, just happy for Callan Harley. But yeah, obviously disappointed for Handley, but we'll see him at the show, shows as a spectator, I'm sure. Yeah, definitely. I remember seeing them both after the fight on the way out. Um, they're walking down together, having a chat and... I said to them something like, oh, look, it's, it's the worst, the best friends there is because they, they've yeah. made such a relationship, aren't they? Like, um, but seeing them both smash to bits and knowing that's what they've done to each other, but then seeing them mates having a drink, having a smoke, having a chat, whatever, is uh, just quite a nice metaphor, really, for the old sport because it's quite a sight in the community, the bare knuckle. Obviously, we're in our early days as a sport, mm-hmm. Bob as the sports come back, I know Ben Knuckles has oh, been yeah. playing for hundreds of years, but I mean, as the sports come back to modern times, let's the say, it's just era, in yeah. its infancy, in the same way UFC was, the UFC promotion was in, in the 90s or early 2000s, whenever that was. Um, so it's still quite a tight-knit community, but it's, it's a really nice metaphor to see them two 
after they've smashed the fuck, whoop, smashed each other up. Yeah. <laughs> Language smashed each other up, um, seeing them best mates again. Yeah, exactly. And it was really nice to see Callan Harley finally sharing that cigar with his opponent. I mean, he's, yeah. he's tried to be, he's tried to share. He has a tradition that I think we mentioned in our interview together about him sharing a cigar with his opponent. And Jamie Oldfield, I believe, left early. And I think Mark Handley lost his cigar. So this was the first time they got to share that cigar, which is a lovely little post-fight tradition from him. He's, a, he's such a genuine bloke. Callan Harley and he's, he's one of the nicest guys and I always like to see him smiling after a fight and, and enjoying himself in the ring which is just really nice to see you know this is a brutal sport but there's no reason that you can't get a buzz out of it and there's no reason you can't enjoy yourself and I think he epitomizes that and it's just yeah it's just really nice to see someone enjoying themselves and and doing well. Next up Reese Murray versus Nathan Leeson a lot of bad blood leading up to this one. Obviously, people would have seen our conference call. If you haven't seen it, even though the fight's already happened, go back and watch it. It was so entertaining and genuinely one of one of the interviews I've had the most fun doing. So that was super cool. Coming in, obviously, with that bad blood, it's always going to turn out to be a great fight. And it was a great fight. The two styles gelled magnificently. You've got two of the guys who have just a great boxing pedigree, a great shape, great movement, just... For the purists, this was one of those fights where you could you, you, you might come into bare boxing with the preconceived notion that it's all about brawling and, 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 and inside fighting. But this fight was just a lovely chess match and just really a pleasure to watch. The two of them boxed out of their skin. That being said, Reese Murray always frustrates me. He always frustrates me because he is so good, but his output is low. It is really low. And that allowed Nathan Leeson to get off that jab and get into his flow and... I feel like a few fights down the line when Reese Murray really gets into his groove, this guy's going to be something special. I really do believe that. But for this fight, he got the knockdown. That gave him the 10-8 in the second round with the straight right. And the two other rounds were Nathan Leeson's. It was, it was just one of those fights. The two of them just boxing out of their skin, fighting really well. I think not really a wasteful shot. It was it was a it was a it was a medium output fight I'd say but not not a a single shot I think that went astray other than that of the you know the head movement that we saw from from both men there was there was a few times where there was a nice little slip but the majority of the shots were well placed well timed they didn't leave themselves open to a counter it was just a nice back and forth affair but yeah Nathan Leeson missed weight again that's always a problem. How seriously is Nathan Leeson taking it? I know Nathan personally, you know, I'm sure he won't mind me saying he really needs to get his head screwed on. He really needs to start making the way and start training to his full potential because we see it every single time. Such potential, such potential from Nathan Leeson. This guy could easily go on and win a world title. It's frustrating to see someone like that with all that potential, not training to their best and not coming in in their best shape. So for me, I just... I'd really like to see Nathan Leeson either take this rematch, which they, they they might do. I think the rematch might be on the table or at least move on, but just make the way, <laughs> train hard. You know what I mean? It's just, it is gutting because he's got such potential. Absolutely. With you mentioning the rematch there, that is something I'd quite like, to be honest, because when you've got all the bad blood charging up the fight and you get a, a draw result, it feels unfinished mm. it feels there's more to do because when all said and done you can argue all you want but we drew there's no real winner so i would love a rematch especially as you could argue nathan had the better fight overall but re scored the knockdown so it's yeah. quite I'm not sure how to put it really there's just such different elements of it whereas reese won that round 10-8 but the more consistent performance was nathan so a rematch would be really interesting. Now, the thing about this fight, why, why BKB24 was so good is because there was just variety in all the fights. And this was one of the fights that was, they looked like boxers. They didn't look like two brawlers. They looked like boxers who were thinking. And I think Robin Reed mentioned this afterwards. He, he said that it's nice to see a bit of actual boxing. You could just yeah. put gloves on them and they would have looked, they would have looked the same. So it's, that's one of the reasons why this show was so great, because you had the variety, and this is for the purists, for the boxers. Good fight. I enjoyed it. Like you said, 
wasn't very very high output wasn't very intense i don't think either guy got out of got out of fifth gear really um but a good fight i'd love to see a rematch really next up ryan barrett versus simon sinkovich man from my home country of poland a man after my own heart simon coming in there was a lot of speculation the guy has done great things in the world of Vittore, you know, the world of Valet Tudo, which if people don't know is bare knuckle MMA. It's, it's absolutely brutal, but the Poles absolutely love it. And uh, I do too, of course. But we didn't know too much about his boxing. Now he's a, a grappler by trade. Ryan Barrett, a, a very good amateur boxer, boxed to a very high level quarterfinals of the ABAs. How was this fight going to plan out? Now, coming in, you, you would you would favour Ryan Barrett. But for those early few rounds, Simon really gave Ryan something to think about. Slipping the straight shots and coming over the top with that looping overhand from left and right. Just, yeah, really impressive. For, for a guy who's, who's 40 years of age, there's always questions, isn't there? For a guy who's, who's not boxed, who's 40 years of age and has taken, you know, a fair few fights. There's a little bit of damage there. For him to come out and perform so dynamically, looking so young and so youthful in his performance was really impressive. He was so much faster than I had him down as. He was he was deceptively quick. And I think Ryan was was caught a fair few times and, and had yeah. to keep his, his wits about him. So, you know, although, of course, Ryan went on to win in emphatic fashion and the knockout of the night for us, I think yeah. it's really important to mention how impressive Simon was. But, yeah, Ryan, as we know, uh, a really good boxer, beautiful, beautiful credentials, um, great fundamental skill set, and just so big and powerful for the weight. I've heard so many sparring stories about this guy. This guy knocks down literally everyone. Um, I know, I know of probably five or six guys from the world of bare knuckle boxing that have said to me that guy literally rocked me, dropped me, and you know, you know, finished me in sparring. So he's he's very much a a one gear kind of fighter he only knows forward um violence maximal violence and just such a scary scary bloke but yeah a lovely double jab right hand to finish the contest just what, knockout. going to move on to bigger and better things cruiser weights watch out this man i'm telling you this now is going to be a problem we've got carl hobley versus mickey parker for the world cruiserweight title i'm not actually sure where the two of them are, because Mickey Parker's talking about potential retirement and Carl Hobley's talking about needing to take some time out. So they does that hold retire. up the division? Mickey won't retire. <laughs> I mean, true, very true. But does that hold up the division? I don't know. But if it does, Ryan Barrett, he needs to be in at least a British title um, fight for the next fight, because, of course, Mickey will move up and fight for the world, vacating his British. So, yeah, Ryan Barrett is, is really one to watch in BKB. He's got a good future, Ryan, because... He does, as he said, he hits very hard. I think he actually broke uh, Matt Hodgson's jaw when they broke, when they fought, sorry. Yeah. Broke his jaw and dropped him very quickly as well. And as well, he did have a very good performance against uh, Anthony Holmes. Anthony yeah. Holmes, obviously, an absolute monster, pound for pound on our list and yeah. world champion after what he did to Lerwell. And Ryan Barrett had a great performance against him. So I think Barrett is a bit of a dark horse. He's, he's a bit underlooks people don't re overlook sorry people don't actually you know notice him for as good as he is and a cracking knockout i think when we know how hard he hits uh shimon took some great shots he had a great chin standing up to it throughout the fight um charles bronson the polish charles bronson he looks like him don't he, that mustache he he looks a hard bloke that can take a shot. He he looks like he could like break pool cues on his head all day long and he wouldn't even blink. He he looks a solid bloke, like his skull looks hard, doesn't it? Mm. I'm not actually spoke to Ryan Barrett, but I bet his hands are smashed to pieces after hitting him in the head. Um yeah. I think the fight could have been stopped a little bit earlier because there was I don't know if it was either a glancing blow and the and a fall, but towards the end, um, Shimon went down and Baz had to help him get up. And he didn't rule it a knockdown, but he, yeah. he couldn't get up. And he's like, 
dangling his head on the ropes. <laughs> I thought, that's not a slip. Like, it's, it's taken the guy 20 seconds to stand up from a slip. I, I would have liked it to see him stops there. And I think, I don't know if it was Sammy that threw the towel in, but she was either telling the corner, throw it in now, or she did it herself. And she's she's mm. completely right, because that needed stopping a little bit earlier, I think. I think so. I think, you know, if you look at the end of that third round, there was a jab, a jab which rocked him massively. And I think fatigue started to set in. I think ultimately when you've got a big lad just coming at you relentlessly and landing shots, it's it's exhausting. It's really <laughs> exhausting getting punched in the face, especially against the puncher. Um, I know that from personal experience, unfortunately. Uh, it's, it's exhausting. The harder they hit, the more it takes out of you. And I think in this circumstance, the, the gas tank started to fade a little bit. The the damage started to pile up. But no, I, I was really impressed by Singovic. I want to see him back in BKB. He's game as you like. And he's actually put his name forwards for April, as far as I'm aware, at least from a, a Facebook comment I saw. So there's a few interesting fights. I'm just going to put it out there. I'd like to see him fight Eric Olsen in, in April, providing he's back on his visa. I'm not sure if it might be back in June. But those guys were both on... Vittore cards and that might be an interesting one for the Polish fans so a good I think a good pay-per-view fight that's a great matchup yeah really good idea versus also yeah so that's that's hopefully the next step for Simon and uh for Ryan it's got to be a title next up Jack McLean versus Ellis Shepherd. my goodness what a build-up this fight had the two of them did not like each other McLean is the funniest guy I have ever seen in BKB. I'm so happy to say that as well. I mean, the two of us, we were watching some of his videos leading up to this fight. And this is probably the first time I think in BKB that something has sent me into hysterics, like actual genuine tears of just pure laughter. That that call out that he had to Shepherd before their fight was the funniest thing. I think it was funnier than our Cheney challenge. Like, I genuinely think... That is the best video that has ever come out of BKB. I was in absolute tears before that fight. And no, that guy, honestly, Jack McLean, what an entertainer. And, About and the flogging? Was it the flogging one? Is the WWE with the... Yeah. <laughs> with the was, it, was, it was so unexpected. It was like he wanted, um, he wanted the loser of the fight to be dragged out by Barrington specifically. <laughs> and flogged on the bare bum three times and to pay Barrington 50... What? what was it, a T-shirt that he wanted to lash it with? It, that was a, a rolled-up T-shirt <laughs> and they had to pay Barrington £15 for his time. It was just so specific. <laughs> it was... It, it was... It just rendered me speechless. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, I love him. I absolutely love him. He's, he's genuinely so funny. And there's always that thing when you see someone on social media and you think, oh, they're quite funny, but what are they like in real life? He's actually like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I met him at the way and the guy's bonkers. I couldn't stop going over and speaking to him. He was just such a great guy. And um, he's obviously a, a military man and, and he'd, he'd done some acting in the past. And you no, know, just great on the camera. And a guy that I hope will come back just purely for, for the personality, but also he, you know, showed some some really fast hands. I mean, that start, my goodness, mm. the two of them. I've not, I'm just going to say this now. That's probably, if we're talking about combined speed, that's probably the fastest fight we've ever seen in terms of hand speed. My goodness, that was a furious pace. But yeah, I think the, the class of Shepherds came through. He's got a lot of bare knuckle boxing experience and he picked apart McLean in the end. But Jack just game as they come, kept getting up. His face was battered, but there was literally no quit in the man. In terms of intangibles, you know, in terms of athleticism, this man has everything. It's just a little bit of technique, a little bit of technical skills, little minor adjustments, little bits and pieces. It's not, it's nothing major. It's nothing really major. He's got the mindset. He's got the athletic base. And those things are almost impossible to build up. So, for a guy like McLean, I see a really promising future for him. I hope he comes back and I hope he he comes in better than ever. But yeah, Shepard, I think, again, rightfully so. Another performance in the night from me. Both of his fights so far have been performances of the night. This guy has to fight for a British title next. He's, for me, the biggest prospect. Um, well, one of the biggest prospects in the sport. He's Every time he steps in there, he's 23. 
23 years old and and the composure that he shows not necessarily when he dropped him the first time um <laughs> yeah, that was yeah. a bit weird celebrating <laughs> He, uh, he definitely gets into it and, and, and interviewing him is a pain afterwards because he moves side to side constantly. But no, technically just outstanding pull counters, angles, movement, just those feet are so, so fast and the hands ridiculous. Um, I was on the side, people comparing him to Dan Chapman. The guy is top notch. And for me, I really am so confident he's a future world champion in BKB. Absolutely agree. I think Shepard has got a really BKB friendly style. When you look at Chapman, you look at Sweeney, both using the feet to get them out of trouble and the hands quite low, quite an open guard. That's exactly what Shepard's got. He's very athletic and he's very quick, both with his hands and his feet. So I completely agree that he's going to go a very long way in BKB if, if he does continue. Because I think McLean would look great against a different opponent. I yeah. think he would have been very good. Just because Shepard is so elite, that's yeah. why it looks a bit one-sided. So don't overlook McLean, because I think he's certainly got a future fighting again. He's got the character and he's got the ability. Mm. So definitely give McLean another shot. But I just think Shepard is miles ahead of anyone in the game at the minute with on his level of experience yeah just the upper body movement the feet to get him out of trouble and he can still be aggressive even though he's backing off because he comes back as soon as his opponent is finished he comes back so he's not someone who's dancing on on the back foot not getting stuck in he's aggressive but his range control is what makes him an absolute killer mm. so well done, Alice Shepard, because you're going to be a world champion one day, I promise you. And yeah. Mr. McLean, if you don't end up a Ben Hooker world champion, you'll get an Oscar or some acting prize or some some on stage, a natural performer. He's naturally charismatic, isn't he? Very colourful, both like literally, you know, blue hair, blue yeah. thing. Ellis had the very colourful uh, hair and the shorts as well. Yeah. I thought I was planned at one point because, like, both of them came in with it with the coloured hair and the coloured shorts, didn't they? I think I think McLean actually saw that Ellis Shepherd was getting braids, and I think he's always had braids, but he added the colour to his hair. I believe him saying to me before the fight, so there was a little bit of coordination. But yeah, I think McLean, the ultimate entertainer, out of the ring. Ellis Shepherd, the ultimate entertainer in the ring. It just yes. it did it really did gel beautifully together, and yeah, just for both of them, I think. They move in different directions, but they definitely move with the company. And for McLean, you know, someone a step down to build him back up. But for Shepard, British title, you know, Craig Rocky Morgan, Ooh. potentially. Um, equally, you know, the two big prospects around that way, Toby Binden versus Ellis Shepard. That's exciting. We can I get that Toby going at 73. Then. That'd be that'd be a slight step up, but obviously Ellis, as he grows with age, he, he's he's going up a weight. He can fight sixty nine kilograms or seventy three, so that would be interesting as well. There's a lot of really exciting fights for Ellis Shepard, and yeah, super impressed. Next up, my third performance of the night: Paul Hills defeating Quarter Stitt in the first BKB versus BYB fight of the night. Of course, for those who aren't aware cross-promotion fight between the American promotion, Backyard Brawlers, and of course, BKB. Just madness. We're now 3-0, which we'll come on to with the McHugh fight as well. Obviously, Barry Jones beat Lewis Mello over in BYB, and now our two victories here. Bit biased, but I think we've we've got the class amongst our ranks to, to show that we are the better company at this stage. God um, save the Queen. Come on, yeah, UK. It's true, and obviously... Guerra, who we'll touch on in a minute, was one of their top fighters. He was 4-0 coming in. So, yeah, we're uh, we're doing pretty well, I have to say. And, and Paul Hills started off proceedings incredibly well. Now, that first round, a little bit worried, I won't lie. Pushed back by the long range. He stick into the corner. Yeah. A number of shots landed. He was sinking down with his Looking hands dangerous up. That. You, you did feel like he was going to touch down at any point. And then there was a slight pause. He wins the famous overhand right and clinched in. 
and kept himself up. But yeah, moments later, <laughs> he drops quarter stick at the dead of the round. And from there, it just changed massively. Paul Hills took over and fought to his authentic self. I think in the last fight against Barry Jones, he came out boxing. That didn't work. He came out against Nathan De Castro. A little, little bit too much aggression. This was intelligent aggression, intelligent pressure. He had his wits about him. He was moving his head beautifully. And as we say, he's one of the only guys in BKB that can actually utilize the high guard, which traditionally we don't see being effectively used just because he he makes himself himself such a small target tucks himself up so well you're going to break your hands on those elbows and if you're not going to break your hands on those elbows you're going to break your hands on his head he really is a bare knuckle friendly style that he has so yeah that jab was sharp powerful and that's what ultimately got him into range and when he got into range he just let his hands go he lets hands go yeah. i think once it had tasted that power a bit of doubt I assume set in from from the body language, Certainly and I faded. Think that allowed Hills to really get his work off and 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 force the bigger, much bigger. I'm going to say much bigger step back, who who had had a bit of a struggle in the way, and he'd had to get into the sauna just before. And when he rehydrated, the guy was huge, you know, absolutely huge, long and rangy. And for Hills to come in and come forwards the way he did, and Really, apart from in that first round, obviously there was a few shots there from Stitt, which landed straight on the chin. But, you know, Hills, he he was pretty defensively sound. He came forwards aggressive and and didn't leave himself open to counters. Yeah, definitely. It was a um, great performance by Paul. Really good. And I'm glad that he got this because he always does work hard. And you know that the success means more to him because it's for himself rather than the validation he gets from the crowd. Yeah. So he'd be just as happy winning that in an empty room because for him, the victory is the treat in itself, not the attention. So I'm really glad for Paul because he, he puts his heart and soul into these. And especially repping the UK, getting us one up, one nil up. Even though you scared us, Paul, in the first 30 seconds or so, or first minute, I was, I was worried, but it doesn't matter because he'd come <laughs> back. And once Paul got on top, then Stitt's just fade and faded and faded it could have been one of or a mixture of he could have fatigued he could have been hurt his confidence could have gone a mix of the above mm. but it was like this train getting momentum once Paul was ahead he widened the gap even more until by the end of it it was a foregone conclusion really and could see what's going to happen so Great performance and the first of a hat trick for the UK. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, massively impressed. Would, would you agree in saying that, that was the best we've ever seen, Paul Hills? Yeah. When you consider the occasion as well, take that into account because it's someone unknown as well, relatively unknown. I think he showed Paul showed heart as well. So not just technical, but he showed good. Well, he always does, but it was a good three-dimensional performance because he planned well, prepared well. He came back from adversity, which makes it a good performance as well, and got the finish. So def certainly the best, if not one of the best performances from Paul. Do you think it's his best? Definitely, definitely. I mean, four knockdowns leading up to the finish. He showed versatility that we haven't seen from him before. He's always been that sort of come forward, overhand right, overhand right. But that jab has quickly become a massive weapon for him as well. And and hooks, body shots, uppercuts, there was literally everything in there. And he picked his punches beautifully and bullied the much bigger guy, which for me was so so impressive it, that was his moment you know that was his moment i remember sitting there looking at him in the ring he was so happy wasn't he sweet caroline in the background the yeah the timing of that. And, and cheering his name <laughs> it was it was one of those moments it's always sweet caroline isn't it the same with dave thomas when he was going out the back it was it was a special <laughs> moment I, I remember sort of looking out and he's getting carted off yeah <laughs> sweet caroline <laughs> 
bone sticking out of his leg. <laughs> put Sweet Caroline on, no one will know. No, it's a special song. And yeah, it contributed to the occasion. And yeah, I, it was nice. It was really nice because we saw that again in, in the McHugh fight where, where the British fans really got behind the BKB boys. And do you know what? It was, it was, it was actually quite nice from my perspective to be animated for once. Obviously, you know, when, when all the lads are BKB fighters, you keep yourself to yourself and, you know, you, you don't do too much. You don't give away too much apart from the obvious awe of the occasion. Um, but here I was able to really, you know, cheer on one of the lads. So obviously got massive respect uh, for Quarter Stick. What a lovely bloke. Um, yes. Had a great, great chat with him. Um, and, you know, when we when we start to talk to a few of the BYB guys, he'll definitely be top of the list just a real great guy and i think showed a lot showed a lot to to like and with his first fight in byb there was questions about what happened there he he was winning the fight and then a bit of a weird one way he, he sort of pulled out and people yeah. questioning the heart coming in i saw a lot of comments but he showed massive heart he kept getting up he took some massive shots and competed with a guy who was you know, coming in on his eighth bare knuckle fight. So yeah, quarter stick, um, as much a hero as, as Paul Hills on the night. That's something I do want to agree with. And I think something that's important we mentioned is that just because obviously we're the English, love the English side, but yeah. we, we can't neglect that. I, th I think Stitt showed some great heart. And in fact, um, Scott, the head of Police Gazette, BKB, next to me, who's handing out the, um, the belts for the... UK versus USA. Me and him both said that Paul's shown a lot of um, Stitt Stitt, showed a lot yeah. of heart, yeah. getting up each time. So I, I don't think that should be overlooked at all because it's. You imagine from his point of view, you've flown to a different time zone, you've struggled to get the tube here. Everyone speaks funny. Everyone's mm. putting the camera in your face, and <laughs> um, you know you're going to fight someone yeah. who's knocked out a lot of people in the first round. Mm. you've got a room full of like drunk English people wanting you to get sparked out and when it's going badly for you and you've got to climb off the canvas so you know b before we forget him or before we say anything bad about State just because he lost you got you got to think what he's achieved so big respect to State and he does seem a really nice bloke as well out of boxing as well don't he Definitely, definitely. That was that was the real nice surprise. You never know of American style, Jakey. No, with him, he was yeah, he was just a, a great guy and and um, yeah, a really nice character. And yeah, it, it was nice to see the BYB's guys coming over and, and sharing that camaraderie that we yeah. get with the BKB guys. You know, we all treated them well. They treated us well. Obviously, Scott Burt, as you say, the head of the International Bare Knuckle Boxing Hall of Fame, he was welcomed with open arms. I think I chewed his ear off a bit too much because I'm just that sort of geek. But yeah, just having the Americans over for was for us was just a, a real pleasure. And I, I really hope that that relationship continues because it's 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 so nice to see two companies in bare knuckle boxing in any combat sport because it never happens, does it? Let's be honest. Yeah, it's true. You know, UFC and Bellator, UFC, one championship. There's many options uh, in the world of MMA that have never happened, but it's just so awesome to see two top Benacle Boxing Company is coming together and that's just a massive respect to the guys at BYB and the guys at BKB for making that happen. The co-main event of the evening and my fight of the night, Carlos Huera versus Scott McHugh. My goodness, what a fight this was. Paolo, you were as impressed as I was, so I'll fire this one over to you for a little bit of analysis. Certainly, this was a fight that we both had high expectations for. And we both actually considered this one of our fight of the night, didn't we? Mm. Fantastic fight. A scary one in the build-up for Scott. Imagine you hearing this undefeated Mexican is coming over from America to <clears> fight <throat> you, especially. You don't know much about him. He doesn't speak English. He's undefeated. And his last name, Guerra, is Spanish for war. Don't you, <laughs> you put his surname in Google Translate, it's war. So you imagine Carl War is coming over to fight you. He's undefeated. He's essentially emotionless. If you saw him in the ring, and um, Scott ne Scott Burt next to me said he does not show an ounce of emotion in the ring. His mm. face he looks like he's just going Sorry. to get yeah, it's just like getting his passport picture done. 
he mm. took a shot, gave a shot. And it's scary to, to be in with someone who's so doesn't give any emotion off because you think, oh my gosh, he doesn't care. Mm. The reason one of the reasons why it was fight of the night for us both is because it is so competitive. How we think Carlos got the first two rounds and then Scott came back and towards the end of the fight that momentum built up for Scott and we started to think he can do this, he can get this win. And it's a great name on on Scott's record. It's a great scalp to have. Undefeated from America. Mexican, the classic Mexican style. It wasn't as, um, the fight wasn't as toe-to-toe fighting in a phone box, eyes closed, swinging for each other as I thought it'd be. It was much more sophisticated. And that was really pleasing to see from Scott because it even further cements that he's not a brawler, he's a boxer now. And I think, to be honest, we can stop saying that now because every time we mention Scott, we always go, yeah, but he used to be a brawler, now he's a boxer. I think now it's just safe to say he's a boxer, a skillful yeah. boxer. And we, we can, for me, that victory over the American is the final nail in the coffin of the idea that, that Scott's this mad brawler. Mm. He's, he's a nutter out the ring, but in the ring now, he is a certified boxer. Great fight, competitive, shots went both ways, good clean shots went both ways, and I think the judges got it absolutely bang on. How about you, mate? You agree with the result, obviously? No, definitely. I think, as you say, he is a boxer, but he's also got that unorthodox nature about him, hasn't he? Yeah. Definitely in those later rounds, especially, I think Quera was almost, you know, looking at him, he didn't show it in his face, but you could tell... He didn't know what to do. What was in front of him. I think there's no one like Scott McHugh. There isn't a star like it. I mean, there's there's those weird left hooks that he throws where he does a I hard did. telegraph. It's a hard telegraph, and it's such a hard telegraph, and it's so oddly timed. But it lands, doesn't it? Act. You yeah, you almost you know it's coming, and you almost think, well, it's so obvious that it's coming that it's not coming, and then it comes, it hits you on the chin, and you go, oh my god, it's such a weird left hook sort of leaning left hook that he throws but if you throw he's just going to roll it like the guy's head movement that's the real thing that's come out of this evolution of scott McHugh is the defensive skills the countering ability of scott McHugh. i think he's becoming a bit more of a counter puncher than anything he is so hard to hit him and, and where in three four and five barely hit him you know he was always throwing but he barely hit him he had to attack the body because that's the only thing that wasn't moving that head movement from scott McHugh. my goodness was it good and just sophisticated um composed intelligent ring craft that we haven't seen from him before every single time he steps into the ring he adds a little notch onto that boxing credential and yeah just massively impressed 2-0 2-0 on this card, 3-0 overall to BKB. I'm going to keep saying that until the next card. <laughs> but yeah, just again, another really impressive performance in what is a extremely dynamic BKB versus BYB partnership. Yeah, great. Um, clean sweep for the Yorkshire boys as well, wasn't it? It was. It was. And, I think it was uh, 3-0. Mark Tiffin, Matthew Hodgson, Scott McHugh, Reese Murray with a draw. So three Zero and one. Very impressive from the clean sheet. Clean sheet for the Yorkshire boys. And um, as well, I just want to say a quick shout out to all the Yorkshire boys who come down, who were supporting Scott in the hotel afterwards. There was uh, Scott and Matty's mates who saw them in uh, Travel Lodge after. Had a few shandies with all the uh, all the Yorkshire boys. And yeah, big shout out. The main event of the evening, the World Heavyweight Championship on the line. And the biggest upset, I'm actually going to say this, probably the biggest upset in BKB history, just a massive upset. If you look at it, 41 years of age. I said he was 42, Jody, um, in our post-fight interview. And he said something along the lines of, F off Harry Potter, I'll chin you one. So I'm going to be very careful about saying that he was 41. Obviously, people will know that when I wear my glasses, I look a little bit like Harry Potter. I do get some stick. I'm I'm planning on getting some laser eye surgery soon. So yeah, Jody Meikle, Dorian Dutch, a cut. Always inconclusive, especially when the fight was going the way it was. I think Dutch getting the better of the later rounds. I think the first round went to Meikle, I think rightly so. But over seven rounds, 
Jody Meikle, at 41 years of age, out of the ring since 2017, very short notice, still over those rounds, has the gas tank and has everything that you want from a bare knuckle fighter. The guy does not cut. He got hit with some disgusting shots. And did he cut? No. Did he get rocked? No. His head, I swear his head hits his back on a few occasions and he just smiled. The guy is known in the domestic circuit for having one of the best chins. You know, like what's he made of? Having... Shots? That, what is he made? Is that the Homer Simpson of boxing, isn't it? No. <laughs> you know, they do the x-ray on his head and the skull's that fake. And then like they put him in the ring with Mike Tyson. He's just battering him and he's not even bothered. It's like exactly. Holmes Simpson of uh, BKB. Unreal. What a uh, chin. He, yeah, I really don't see anyone knocking him out. Like the guy was actually a super middleweight slash light heavyweight in his professional boxing days. And he's gone up to heavyweight and he literally just takes them with sugar and milk. Like the guy is, <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen anything like it. So, you know, durability, um, survival instincts, ring craft. Do you know, there's so many things there. He is a survival expert, but not only is he a survival expert, he's a very, very intelligent boxer. And the real difference we saw there, the cut underneath the eye, as you know, where the cheekbone is, there's a raised area where you've got the raise and the dip of that cheekbone. Chopping right hand over the top. And that chopping right hand caught the exact perfect area for that sort of cut. And it ripped Dorian Darch's face open. It was at the early in the first round, I believe. And then mm. obviously a second cut over the eye on the fourth. Just mad. Like I didn't see this happening. I think it might maybe a little bit disrespectful for someone of Meikle's experience to write him off. But just like Jay Kerr earlier, who proved me wrong as well, I, I wrote him off. I, I thought that Dorian was definitely going to win this fight. But Jody Meikle just showing that experience, showing that heart. And for a man who I believe is the only man in professional boxing history to ever have a point deducted for clowning, there wasn't any of that fun, jokey Jody Meikle when he got into the ring. That man was seriously switched on and he came to win. And, and there was a hunger in his eyes that I don't think we've seen from him in quite some time. So, yeah, I think Jody Meikle, he's game as he comes. He's talking about coming back and fighting multiple times. So that's great. He's not going to hold up the division. Do we see Darch versus Meikle the rematch? That's the question we're going to ask. Because Daniel Podmore, of course, was supposed to fight Dorian Darch. That fight fell through due to an injury to yeah. the lat of Daniel Podmore. Was there enough there to hold up the division and hold up Do Daniel Podmore, who's been waiting for this world title shot for so long? I don't know. I want to hear your verdict on that one, Paolo. It's... The rematch, I think, is a tricky one because yeah. Mikko came in on very short notice and he did very well. However, I still can't help thinking in the back of my head that the cut, I don't believe in lucky punch. This is a horrible word because you threw the shot with the intent of damaging your opponent and it landed. Mm. But if that punch was an inch lower and it didn't cut um, Darch, I think we could have seen a different result. So I think Dorian would get the rematch. I think, I think he would win the rematch, not necessarily by knockout, because Mikkel showed great chin and very efficient defence, very subtle and very efficient defence. Mm. So obviously he's got to defend his title, and I think the rematch is the most natural first defence because of a cut is such a controversial ending. So yeah. I'd predict that it'd be a rematch. I think Dorian would get it on on the rematch. And then I'd love to see what we originally expecting. Um Dan Podmore versus Dorian, but with Dorian as the incumbent, the champion reigning. I'd personally prefer just to see Daniel Podmore going there straight away. If I'm honest, if I'm completely honest mm -hmm. with you, I think Yes, it was a controversial ending, but there wasn't that much leading into it. You know, it wasn't mm -hmm. maybe the fight that people thought it was going to be. But I don't feel like, in comparison to the fight with Ricardo Franco versus Jimmy Sweeney, that it deserves to have the rematch to hold up the division. Daniel Podmore is, quote-unquote, the best heavyweight we have. He's proven himself the most. I think I'd like to see that fight. I'd like to see Dorian Darch heal up, take some time off reset, mm -hmm. come back better than ever. Because really, I think 
it was as much about the cut as it was about Dorian Dutch's game plan. He was coming forwards aggressively and, and walking on to, to Mikkel. Not much in the way of defence. You know, he was just trying to walk down and bully his man. The jab that he shot out a few times looked really sensational, which is something we didn't see in his professional boxing career. That jab is sharp, it's accurate, it's fast. I'd like to see him just box a little bit more. He's He's got that in him. I, I know he, he fights like a puncher and he comes forward aggressively and wading forwards. But if that cut is going to be an issue, obviously, as we know, as you get older, you cut easier. Unless you're J.D. Meikle for some reason, I have no clue <laughs> how he's so durable. But as we say, he is, I mean, the Homer Simpson of uh, BKB in, in the nicest possible sense. He, he he definitely deserves every victory he gets, of course. But um, yeah, Dorian, I think we'll need to have his wits about him. And I'm not going to say respect because I believe that Dorian Dutch definitely respected the potential of J.D. Meikle coming in and, and causing an upset. But he definitely needs to have his wits about him a lot more in the rematch. So I think it will take a little bit of time to adjust, change the game plan, heal up, make sure that those cuts are fully sealed, get some CBD on there, get some some good stuff, um, and then just come back stronger than ever. But I, I really, with the lack of damage that Jody Meikle took, um, at least externally, I think he probably could jump on April, June and fight Daniel Podmore, who's just waiting in the ranks for his world title shot. No, George, I, th- I think I've been a bit unfair looking back on what we've just said. I think the way I've spoken, I've made it look so much like what did Dorian do wrong rather than what did Mikkel do right. Mm. Like, because Mikkel moved so efficiently, because his defence was so efficient, because he was so clever with his work, it was just easy to overlook. But you can't miss the facts that he won fair and square mm. on very short notice against a former professional glove boxer who's fought Anthony Joshua. And Mikkel's back in work on Monday, 7 a.m. Monday, he was there. So I think I'd probably just like to balance out a bit what I said before. The way I was speaking, I think it come a bit across like Mikkel was lucky, but you make your own luck in life, you make your own luck in fighting. So completely fair play to him. And it's he's, he's a credit to himself. And no matter what he does, Next fight, whether it's Podmore or Darch, mm. I'm, I'm sure we're going to see much more of him. And I'm sure he's going to be in some great seven rounders because he's got the durability for a seven rounder at a heavyweight. Mm. So we, we could be in with some good, entertaining fights from Michael in the future. Well done to both men as well. Well, unlucky Dorian, but his bare knuckle boxing, one shot can turn the whole thing upside down, as we saw with Johnny Lawson as well. So start to finish. Just bring it full circle. First fight and last fight, one shot, change the whole thing. Definitely. And then before we go into the outro, I want to hear what the fans have to say. Would you rather see Daniel Podmore versus Jody Meekle? Or would you rather see the rematch? Just let us know in the comments below. And that's us, ladies and gentlemen. BKB24 post-fight reflections over and done with. One of our longest videos to date, but there was just so much to say if we reduced it down to a 20 minute 10 minute video it wouldn't have done the card justice for me as i say the best cards definitely since bkb 17 maybe even the best we've ever had super impressed by the matchmaking super impressed by the warriors that put their lives on the line in that ring on saturday night so yeah from me and paolo it's a thank you very much for watching and also Thank you very much for subscribing. 1,000 subscribers. We finally got there, the milestone. We've earned, I think, £5.64 so far. We're absolutely rolling in the dough. We'll soon be able to have a pair of shoes between the two of us. So, fantastic times, Paolo. Yeah, fantastic times. £5.64 divided in two ways is, what, 282 I think, about? Yeah, 232 Two, oh, no, 282 yeah, sorry. 282 yeah. 30, yeah, that's bad for me. Yeah, so £2.82. I- I do the finance at Toad the Line, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so if you've got any suggestions with what George and I should spend the money on, let us know. Um, it's not much going for two for 262 each, is there? Nah. But we're happy anyway. Long story short, thank you for the subscribers. It means a lot. This past year, the subscribers have doubled from the start, from 400 and something to over 800. And now we've made it to 1,020, I think. A th- so keep them coming. 1,030. Paolo. Well. And we've done 100 this month, which is uh, last 28 days, which is pretty cool. So that's yeah. 
yeah, people are people are joining the journey. Um, it's nice, isn't it, to you know coming up and and meeting fans that actually watch the channel, which is which is awesome, and and getting nice comments from people. And yeah, we just we do actually genuinely appreciate it. As I say, it's just a little bit of a passion project for the two of us, and to have anyone watch it that isn't our parents and you know friends is is, is a lovely bonus. <laughs> We should probably, I think we should probably dedicate the 1,000 subs to our number one fan that died in front of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, un- unsuccessfully about a year ago tried doing a podcast that was about three hours long and uh, only one person watched it to the end. So um, we assumed someone died in front of the computer while it was playing. So uh, God bless. Yeah. And uh, God bless Mudger Smith as well um, for joining. He's us not dead. Board. He he was just on the podcast. He was he, just on the podcast. He's just so on the he, podcast. He's not been the same since. None of us have. You know, <laughs> it was just, it was a it was a terrible podcast. But if you have a spare three hours and you want to be the second person to make it to the end, <laughs> of that, then just let us know. But yeah, signing out, guys. Thanks for your time.